We're continuing tonight in a series of messages on the <clears throat> revelatory ministry of Christ's miracles. Did we learn something about Christ in them? It should not surprise us just on an intellectual level that all things are possible with Christ and with God. These, this is asserted several times throughout Scripture, so this ought not to be a strange thing to us, but to actually perceive this in to perceive this, that there is no circumstance to which Christ is not equal. To actually see that, well, that's, that's another matter. <laughs> but that's what, we, that's what we want to strive to see, to connect, to associate these things with our own condition and with those around us. That uh, you may confront things that baffle you, but Jesus doesn't con confront things that baffle him. You may see things that challenge your strength and are beyond your ability, but Jesus, he, Jesus doesn't do this. Nothing beyond his ability. Amen. <clears throat> I want to comment just briefly before we begin on, on Christ's ministry, what the purpose of it was, why Jesus came into the world. Mm -hmm. I'm here talking about the, the, his life from, particularly from his baptism to his betrayal, mm -hmm. that period of time. What, what was that all about? Why did Jesus spend this somewhere between three and three and a half years? After he was baptized the River Jordan until he was betrayed in the garden. What exactly what was going on in that period of time? See, we, have, we have proclaimed quite frequently what accomplished what was accomplished in his death, what was accomplished in his resurrection, what's accomplished in his intercessory ministry at the right hand of God. That's sort of so to speak the meat and core of what's happening now. What about that time frame? Why why so long? Why such a lengthy period? Well, there are several statements of this in Scripture. Well, here's one statement, John 3.19. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world. Uh -huh. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, during this period, he illuminated the human condition. Uh -huh. He's come in as a, as a great sunlight and, and people didn't prefer him. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, these, this is what necessitated his death. See, it's, it's why he had to die. Why something had to be done about it. If man had just the smallest amount of good in him, it would have surfaced when the light entered into the world. Right. Here's another statement of the case. Why Jesus came into the world. Why this... This period of time is public, his public life, from when he was uh, baptized to when he was betrayed. This is John 9, 39. For judgment, I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. <laughs> see, people couldn't recognize the real case. The people they thought were informed were really blind. And the people looked very simplistic like they didn't know it. Those are the people God could work with through Christ. So he came into the world for judgment during that period. He's illuminating people. Now here's another statement of this ministry of, of Jesus. Acts 1.21 Wherefore of these men which have comforted with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. <laughs> so, so Jesus in his earthly ministry, he showed you how he conducted himself with his disciples and how he conducted himself when he was with other people without. It's kind of illuminating when you read the Gospels with this in mind. And you can't read... <laughs> You can't read the Gospels and come up to the conclusion that Jesus preferred to be around publicans and prostitutes. Mm -hmm. I know this is taught a lot and said a lot, but you... <laughs> I don't know where they got this. It's out of some book man wrote. It's not out of the book of Christ. Here's Acts 2.22. Here's another statement. What was accomplished now in this period of time? Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know. Mm -hmm. 
So Christ earth the earth, he showed what God can do to a, to a man. And he, uh, God approved him. Was it really, it was, he wasn't looking for man to approve him. He was demonstrating that he approved of Christ. And one more, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So that's, that's an index to what God does. He seeks to do good and to heal those that are oppressed by the devil. Now, with that in mind, all of Christ's <coughs> miracles are connected with those things I just read. They're connected with those things. In these miracles of Jesus, light is shining. That illuminates who, who, who is real and who's not. In these miracles, judgment has come. So people are, opportunity is given to this person and that person to see. The same opportunity blinds others that are there. In these miracles, Jesus is moving in and out among us. He heals people in the synagogues. He goes out to Gadara, Gentile country, and he heals over there. See, there's demonstrated this. In these miracles, God is approving of Jesus. So is he doing things no one else could, could do? And he's, uh, he's showing he's anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. Now, those things that might I want to deal with a man with a withered hand tonight. It's in three, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm going to read Luke's account of this. Luke, the sixth chapter, verse 6 through 11. It came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. <coughs> and he rose and stood forth. Then Jesus said unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the circumstances of this uh, marvelous miracle. Again, it takes place in a, in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. Several, several things happened. The Gospel writers highlight a lot what Jesus did on the Sabbath day. And they emphasize it. To teach us that we really ought to expect Jesus to do something when we come together. Amen. He was in a synagogue. Mark 3, 1 tells us he entered again into the synagogues. He frequented this quite often. And keep in mind the synagogues weren't exactly an ideal place as you could see by the circumstances. And Jesus was, when he was there, was being watched by his critics. <laughs> Mark 3, 2 says that they watched him. Whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. Our text in Luke said the scribes and Pharisees watched him. Whether he'd heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. So you almost get the idea this guy had been planted there. <laughs> or whether he was regular there, I don't know. <laughs> They're watching him. Watch it in to see whether somebody might get a blessing from him <laughs> on the Sabbath day. <laughs> now we shouldn't be surprised. I've been in a lot of places where they kind of wondered whether you might get a blessing on the Lord's day. They kind of watched you. See if something might come through. And it also took place when Jesus was teaching. This is another kind of common thing in Jesus' miracles. See? He wasn't just wandering about looking for an opportunity to do something. He was teaching. He was elucidating upon God and the purpose of God. Teaching on the Sabbath day. Luke 6.6 6 tells us this. He came to pass also on another Sabbath day that he entered into the synagogue and taught. Mm -hmm. Later in the garden, Jesus told him that he taught daily in the temple. I was with you daily in the temple. He taught. So Jesus was a teaching Savior. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Let me tell you, you spend time around Jesus, you will learn something. Uh -huh. Amen. You will pick up on something. <coughs> and the scribes and the Pharisees during this occasion were seeking to accuse him, find something about him. They might find an accusation against him. Why? Well, he was disrupting their whole way of thought. He was disrupting their what they taught. He was disrupting everything about them. And so they're looking for something to point out some failure in him. Well, <laughs> just think if everybody was watching you to see whether you'd slip up. Like how long would they have to watch? Probably not very long. But after they watched the entire ministry of Jesus, they couldn't find a thing. Amen. In fact, he challenged them. Which of you convinces me of sin? Which one? <laughs> Point it out. Well, see, I don't advise that any of you say this. Ask this. But Jesus could ask this. Uh -huh. uh, Jesus is not intimidated by the enemies. So Jesus is in the synagogue, being watched by his critics. He's teaching. His critics are looking for him to slip up somewhere. And then there's a man there who has a withered hand. We understand some versions say arm, but the idea was that all of the strength went out of it and it was just useless. He couldn't do anything with his hand. Luke tells us it was his right hand. His right hand was with it. It was a hand he couldn't get hold of anything with. If he was a musician, like uh, Isaac and Toby, and the girls too, he couldn't play. He couldn't get hold of anything. If he were to be a carpenter, like Jesus was, he couldn't, uh, couldn't get hold of the tools with that hand. He couldn't get hold of anything with his hand. If he was a vineyard dresser, he was not the last person that had something they couldn't use. No. Mm. He was not the last person that some part of their person couldn't be used. Mm -hmm. I've known people have withered minds. Mm -hmm. They couldn't think. <coughs> they couldn't connect anything with God. Withered. Withered. Couldn't do anything mm -hmm. with the Lord. Now that's the kind of man that hits here. That's the circumstance. Synagogue. Favorable surrounding. Mm -hmm. Jesus is there. Well, you can't get a bigger advantage than that. He's teaching. Mm -hmm. It's a learning environment. Some enemies are there. Some hostile forces. And in the middle of all it, here's this man in Christ's presence, in the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, with a withered head. Uh -huh. No, it shouldn't surprise you if you're in holy environs and still have some incapacities. Mm -hmm. right. But they can be dealt with. Now, in this circumstance, Jesus confronts the law mentality. Excuse me, a law mentality. Law versus grace is seen here. Now, what would you... You're in the synagogue. Jesus is there. He's teaching. What kind of question would you ask? What kind of question would you ask Jesus at a time like that? Well, here's the question that they ask. Mine has got an advantage now. They've got access to the light who's come into the world. There he is. Here's the one that knew the Father. In fact, he knew all things and he knew what was in man. What do you ask somebody like this? Here's what they ask. <clears throat> is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? That was their question. That was it. Hmm? Had access to the light of life. The one who has such a, he had with a walking compendium of heavenly knowledge and understanding. What do they ask? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Hmm? Well, I've known people have opportunity to learn something from God and they'll ask, is it right to smoke? Hmm? Or though they, should we go to movies? So when you hear that law doesn't even know how to ask a question, mm -hmm. you've got, if you expect to learn something from Jesus, you have to learn to ask the right questions. Here's Jesus, of whom Isaiah said, 
that he would magnify the law and make it honorable. So here's a person who could really, <laughs> what a definition of right and wrong. Here's somebody that could give it all right. So they ask him, what, uh, let me tell you something. You can't see Jesus through the lens of the law. The law is like a lens. Put a special lens, put a wide angle lens on your camera. Or telephoto lens on your camera or a fisheye lens on your camera. You look through it and everything looks different depending on what kind of lens you got on there. If you have a telephoto lens, it looks real big. If you have a fisheye lens, it looks real small. If you have a wide angle lens, it looks, you get the whole scope. If you take the lens of law and look at Jesus, you can't see him for what he is. The law was given to bring us to Christ, but it didn't expound Christ. It didn't open Christ up. Mm -hmm. Ministry cannot properly be perceived by law. Cannot. <clears throat> what a question. I can't. <laughs> in a sense, it's uh, in a sense it's humorous, in a sense it is not. Mm -hmm. To have access to the Son of God in this law mentality. And they ask it, not they weren't looking for an answer, they're trying to trap mm -hmm. Jesus. Now in the midst of all this, we're looking at the circumstances. The, uh, Jesus calls this man forward. He says, Stand forth. That is a good come into the come up in front here and stand before everybody. <laughs> That's what it's about to. Come up in front here and Stand before everybody. Let's have a look at you. I'm going to, I want you to I want everybody to see you. Why? Well, because he's going to do something here. He's going to do something. As this multitude asked Jesus his, uh, his this question, Jesus himself he he speaks back. Grace speaks. Here's law speaks. Is it right? Can we do this? This is law. I'd say what Jesus speaks. Grace speaks back. Is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? That's his question. He's not looking for an opportunity to avoid doing what's wrong. He's looking for an opportunity to do what's right. That's the difference between law and grace. Grace is saying, what can I do? What, what can I do? Grace is looking for opportunity to do something. Here's something else he said, Matthew 12, 11. What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and fall, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold of it and take it out? Notice how grace talks. Here's Mark 3, 4. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? <laughs> which, is, which is right? You want to damage somebody on the Sabbath day or help them? Which one? Which means there's really no neutral. There's really no neutral zone. Mm -hmm. For Christ to be present, and there to be a man with a withered hand there, and nothing to be done about it, he'd be, Jesus would have left him in the worst state. Mm -hmm. When Jesus is confronted with a condition, he does something about it. And Luke says that he asked him, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or evil, to save life or to destroy it? It's actually what they're about to. They ask the wrong question. Maybe that's the reason why some people don't get answers. I've known people that for years and years and years have had the same questions. They're just the same question. Never are satisfied. Why not? They're probably the wrong questions. Not the, not the right ones. So learn to ask right questions. But when Grace spoke to them, it stopped their mouths. Mm -hmm. Here's what it says, but they held their peace. None of them philosophized with Jesus. None of them said, well, what I think is, no. <laughs> stop their mouths. It is possible to have answers that stop the questions. Amen. Jesus did it. We must, uh, we have access to it too. <coughs> See, the person with an inclination to law can't receive the saying that Jesus gave. They can't think in terms of do good or evil, save or help. 
They can't, they can't think. The law doesn't think in that dimension. It thinks about what's wrong. Let me see if I can see some wrong here. Why is that? Because law is not a faith. Faith is not operative under law. Galatians 3.12 says that the law is not of faith. The Amplified Version says, Amplified Bible says, the law does not proceed from faith or produce faith. Faith isn't connected to law. It's just separate. It has nothing whatsoever to do with law. Yep. The Ten Commandments did not command anybody to believe. Amen. Moses never called upon anybody to believe. Yep. Nobody. There's no commandment under the law that says, have faith. None. Zero. Why? Because law is not a different principle. It has nothing more to do with faith or trust or reliance. It has to do with you doing. That's its total implication. Law condemns and grace frees. Now Paul gives excellent treaties on the difference of law and grace in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6 through 9. He's going to compare the law with grace or the old covenant with the new covenant. He's going to compare them. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. The letter is, is it lawful to do good on the, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. If the ministration of death, that's the law, that's, a, that's a describing the law of the Old Covenant, the ministration of death, it killed people. If the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit, that's the New Covenant, be rather glorious, that is not fade, keep getting brighter, for if the ministration of condemnation, that's law, be glory, much more shall the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Christ's words were like a light that just outshined their question. He, he, the sudden burst of light came from Jesus and all of a sudden their question just, just became irrelevant. It was drowned out. Here's a man with a withered hand. Is he interested in the law of the heal on the Sabbath? When he hears about some law about life or healing or helping, who's going to keep on asking what's wrong? Different mentality completely. The mind of the flesh versus the mind of Christ. Now, when they uh, their question and their conduct, how did this how did this affect Jesus? Now, first of all, he. Uh, Jesus did, he's noted, you know, for asking these penetrating questions. He asked, like, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? Mm -hmm. See? Someone asked you, should I do this and should I do that? That answer, like, stifles the question, just stifles it. Here's another. He said, when is the baptism of John from heaven or earth? He said, what's written in the law? How readest thou? Oh, that's a good one. Someone asks you about something, say, well, well, how do you read the law? What, how do you read the law? Almost invariably, they don't have a faintest idea of what it says. And again, he said, uh, what is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected, the saints become the head of the corner. Explain that to me. Well, their question and their attitude had an impact upon Jesus. This is what I want you to see here. Jesus is... Uh, light. He's exposing who people really are. Mark says he looked round about upon them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart. So the whole their whole posture made Jesus angry. <laughs> so thought ever does it into your mind sometimes the thought that you could make Jesus angry? I don't want to even think about it, but it is possible. It is possible, but gravitating down to the flesh and looking at things under the law and trying to find fault and this sort of thing. This can anger Jesus. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to face, face an angry Jesus. Amen. 
Remember, David said, don't chasten me in your fierce anger. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I don't want to deal with an angry God. Lord knows Jesus came to, to take away wrath, save us from wrath. We sure don't want to sur cause it to surface by what we do. How can Jesus actually be angered and God actually provoked by people's conduct or by their words? Some people would say, well, oh no, the Lord understands. He, he can handle your anger. I've actually heard people say this. You define people like that, it's kind of eliminate them from public speaking. Here's Deuteronomy 9.8. In Horeb, that's another word for Mount Sinai, where the law was given. In Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, so the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. Can, Jesus, can God be angered? Yes. Yes. Who knows where you and I would be if God's anger had not been quelled by Jesus? Who knows where we'd be? We may not be it, we may not be have been at all. First Kings eleven nine. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared unto him twice. If God invests a lot in you, and who here hasn't had a lot invested in you, and it doesn't yield anything, you got God upset. He'll be angry. God doesn't like sowing his seed and not getting anything back. He looked round right about him with anger, and he was grieved for the hardness of the heart. Just broke him down, so to speak, inside. God said of Israel in Psalm 95, 10, 40 years long, I was grieved with this generation. For 40 non-stop years, these people upset and grieved God. Talk about long-suffering. Why was he so long-suffering? Because the Savior was coming. Amen. Amen. If you were to take the coming out of the picture, coming to Christ out of the picture, they would not have lasted that 40 years. Let me right. tell you. And God's not going to put up with nonsense for 40 years today. Not since Jesus has come. This kind of long suffering is over. Don't harden your hearts as they did in the time of provocation, the scripture says. Hebrews 3.10 testifies again, I was grieved with that generation. They do always err in their heart. <coughs> they always go the wrong way. I, I've noticed people, two kinds of people in my life. There was one kind of people, they always, they always side with what's right. Sometimes the people are not noted for saying a lot. They're kind of silent type people, but they're godly people. But they always side with the right. Sister Becky knows this person, Sister June, was Sister Nell Losey. She's with the Lord now. She was not an outspoken type person, but whenever there was an issue, she's always on the right side. Amen. Huh? If there was ever some kind of division that occurred among the people, my mother was this way. If there was ever some kind of division that occurred among the people, they were on the right side. There's other people, they're always on the wrong side. If there's some kind of faction that starts, they're on the wrong side. Well, they err in their heart, see? How does that affect God? It grieves them. It grieves them. He's grieved with, uh, he's angry and he's grieved because of it. But this doesn't stop him from working. He now does the impossible. He asks this man to do something that can't be done. He doesn't like cry out, be healed! See? <laughs> he's going to tell this man to do something. Uh -huh. You better see something about, about Jesus. Some some people are just they're like Naaman. They're like Naaman. Naaman came to the the prophet Elijah and wanted him to do something with him. Or Elisha wanted him to do something with him, uh -huh. and uh, he thought he was going to strike his hand over. Got to make be healed. You know, uh -huh. like that. Instead, the prophet told him to do something. Uh -huh. But I washed at the River Jordan, dipped down there seven times. Not once, twice, seven times. It'd be easy, I suppose, if you could just ask the Lord just to kind of make it go away. Mm -hmm. Well, no, he could do this, to be sure, but this is not ordinarily his manner. 
You're going to tell a man to do something, something impossible. You're going to get a little index to Christ's character. If you want the Lord Jesus to really bless you, you're going to have to get ready. He'll ask you to do something that will look like you can't do. And he'll put you to the test to see whether you'll do it or not. Here's what he said. Stretch forth your hand. Hmm. All three writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all say the same words. Stretch out your hand. Clear it out. It's withered now. There's no muscle in it, no nerve in it, no strength in it. Stretch it out. Never been able to use it before, at least not at this time. Couldn't use it. Useless. Stretch it out. You may have a mind that's been very, very unproductive. And he may say, think on these things. Amen. Huh? Amen. You may be dull and uh, not have a lot of affection, not have a lot of passion. Kind of blasé. He may say, set your affection on things above. <laughs> you know, the Lord's going to ask him to do something impossible. Indeed, he will. See, his words with, with power. Luke 4.32 says, They were astonished at his doctrine or his teaching, for his word was with power. So when he says, stretch out your hand, that word it comes, comes with power. It only re remains for the man to respond to it. <laughs> Scripture says, All the earth will fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Mm -hmm. Why? Because what he says has power. Now this transforms Bible reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This takes it out of the devotion stage and puts it into the feeding stage. Mm -hmm. Because God asked you to do a lot of things in the scripture. Mr. Vanessa dealt with some of them. Like, Be perfect. Mm -hmm. That's like stretch out your hand. Mm -hmm. Withered hand. Mm -hmm. Same thing. It's like to say to a layman, pick up your bed and walk. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. If you take Jesus seriously, you'll be able to do what he says because Amen. his word comes with power. Amen. This fulfills what he said in Psalm 33, 9. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Stretch out your hand. <clears throat> he had to act like he'd never acted before. <laughs> How can he do this? Well, really, he just has to have a heart to do what the Lord said. And that's, that, that, that'll cause it to happen. Let's look at it this way. Every man, every woman, every boy and girl can do what they ought to do. If the Lord says something to you, in Scripture I'm thinking particularly, if He addresses something to you, it doesn't make any difference how impossible it seems. You can do it. Amen. Just as sure as this man could stretch out his hand. He's an example of doing something that's impossible. In a sense, power is like embedded in your obedience. It's like embedded in there. So if you ex exert yourself to do what the Lord says, He grants the power to do it. Because He's not going to give power to someone who doesn't have the will to do it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have the heart to do it. The person who believes always obeys. Mm -hmm. Abraham, with very uh, very little information from God, when he was called, he obeyed and he went off, not knowing where he was going. He obeyed by faith. Noah, by faith, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, he was warned of a flood that never rained. <laughs> Nobody had seen rain. Right. And all of a sudden, God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the world with rain. Forty days of rain, he'd never seen one second of rain. Uh -huh. But faith uh, started building. Amen. Built the ark. Rather large project. Took him 120 years to build uh -huh. it. And he saved his house. Uh -huh. He saved his house. Yeah. And how about uh, <coughs> Shamgar, the judge? Shamgar, the son of Anath. He slew 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Now what do you suppose you'd do if you faced 600 warring Philistines? They were, they were noted for being fierce warriors. What would you do? 
Well, if you had faith, you just grab your ox gold. <laughs> I can tell you that he hadn't been in the habit of slaying hundreds of people with his ox gold. It was an ox gold. It wasn't a warring instrument. Mm -hmm. But at the word of the Lord, he picked it up, did battle with it. I'm showing you here that faith enables you to do what can't otherwise be done. Amen. David said of him, he prevailed against the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Mm -hmm. And smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. 1 Samuel 17, 51. Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine, took his sword, mm -hmm. which was, you know, not a, a pretty good sized sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head. Now, <laughs> faith can do things like that. He was probably almost twice as tall as David. Season warrior, so I'm showing you that faith can do what God requires. Let me give you another example. Here's, here's Saul of Tarsus. Jesus calls him and he commissions him on the road to Damascus. And when he stood before Agrippa, Paul told Agrippa what Jesus told him on the road to Damascus. And it amounts to stretching out a withered hand. It amounts to something that big. Here's what he said. And it's Acts 26, 17. Through 19, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes. Yeah. How's, how's that for starters? To turn them from darkness to light, mm -hmm. from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that's in me. Well, Paul, that sounds like a pretty ambitious schedule. Well, how did you respond to that? He tells Agrippa, with the king Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I, I stretched out my hand. I did. I just set out to do what Jesus said. Yeah, here I'm showing you that you find in this miracle that if Jesus' words can ever penetrate your ear, if it can ever get through to you, what Jesus has said, and if you will act upon what he has said, you'll get it done. Amen. If he says fight a good fight, you know, not, a, not a halting fight, not an up and a down fight, fight a good fight and get hold of eternal life. Get, get hold of it. See, maybe your hand's withered. Maybe, maybe you haven't been able to get hold of it. Maybe, you, maybe you've never been convinced in your soul that you have eternal life. John said he wrote to the people that you might know you have eternal life. That's 1 John 5.13. I write unto you that you might know you have eternal life. That's getting hold of eternal life. Well, you say, well, I don't know. I, I'm wondering about that. Stretch out <coughs> that withered hand and lay hold on eternal life. He'll give you Amen. grace to do it. You can see these things, I'm sure. <clears throat> now, those who know their God, Daniel said, will do great... <coughs> exploits. Not those who know about God, and those who know their God will do great exploits. They'll like stretch out their withered hand. Daniel 11.32 says, such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. That is, they'll, they'll just keep going down. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And that is even if they have to stretch out a withered hand. I will tell you that the, there are some, some frail crutches that men tempt to, attempt to use when they serve the Lord. There's the frail crutches of education and science and procedures that can't enable a man to stretch out his hand. They're like the Egyptians and relying upon them. Second Kings 18.21 says this, Thou therefore thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it'll go into his hand and pierce it. So it's just like it's just like a a sharp cane with a point on the top of it. When you lean on it, it just goes right through your hand. You're the worst for it. But when you lean on Christ's word, this never happens. Amen. Amen. This never happens. When you act, when Jesus says, stretch out your hand, 
it never pierces your hand. You you never get you're never harmed by doing what Jesus told you to do. Amen. You'll Amen. never be the worst for it. Amen. See, faith says, "Give me a word from God. Give me a word from God. I'll act upon it." If the, if the Lord says, stretch out your hand, I'll, I'll stretch it out. I need, but I need a word from the king to do it. Now, I tell you, you have an attitude like that, you'll get a word from the king. It'll come through. Now, how did all this affect the religious wicked? How did it affect them? You'd think, boy, with that wonderful part? Just to see a man stretch out his withered hand. Well, that, that wasn't all that wonderful to these people. Here's what the scripture says of them, Matthew 12, 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against them, how they might destroy him. <laughs> That's how it affected them. Why? Because it, it exposed them. They had something withered too. Ah, their, their hearts and minds were withered, and this was actually, this was an opportunity. They could have been corrected too. Their hearts could have been made strong. Uh-huh. But to, unlike that, man, they refused to stretch toward uh -huh. stretch toward Christ. <coughs> Mark 3, 6 says, The Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians, a political branch. Yeah. With the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So we, we want to get rid of him. Yeah. Just saying, we'll have people going to the synagogue and being healed. We want to get rid of them. On the Sabbath day, there'll be, there'll be things begin happening on the Sabbath day. We don't get rid of him. Well, some of you probably have experienced not being wanted in certain religious environments because you expected something to happen. Maybe you weren't, they didn't appreciate that very much. Luke 6.11 6, 11 says, They were filled with madness and communed with one another what they might do to Jesus. <laughs> this sounds foolish, doesn't it? What they might do to what do you suppose they're going to do to Jesus? Now this is sort of toward the front part of his ministry, around the first about a year had passed. But they couldn't do anything to him till the appointed time came. Uh -huh. till he Amen. laid down his life, they could have all the conferences they wanted. Amen. They couldn't do a thing. Amen. So only when he made himself available, when the hour came to lay down his life, then they could do something, but notwithstanding, they, their hearts were so hard, they kept on plotting for a little over two years. They kept on plotting on how to destroy Jesus. And then when they did, they actually thought that it was them, that they, they really outsmarted him and did it. The divine power exposes the impotence of human wisdom and strength. Amen. When the Lord works, it shows really what man can't do as well as what God can do. Amen. And you can't take life like that and fit it into the mold of law. You can't systematize divine power. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you could, maybe this was like the first Sabbath of the month. You could, someone might say, if you come on the first Sabbath of the month, then you, then something could happen. To you. You, could, you couldn't systematize this. Jesus had to be there, but then Jesus had to see you and focus on you too. Jesus had just look past this man like he did all the impotent and folk at the porch of Beth, at pool of Bethesda where it said many with, withered people were there. He didn't look at them. If he hadn't looked at this man, if he hadn't focused his attention on this man, he'd have left with a withered hand. He'd have left with it. When Jesus focused on, it, on him and he did what Jesus said by faith, he left with a whole hand. A person who thinks in terms of law cannot even say grace. I've had, to pr I've actually had people practice this sometimes. There's people that are under law. So let's all say grace. Let's say <laughs> grace. Grace. It's hard for them to say, even to say the word. It's hard. But I'll tell you, the closer you get to Christ, the more wonderful. How wonderful. Amen. It's, it's music to your ear to hear about grace. Amen. Well, a person dominated by law can't trust. Now, I, I haven't always known this. Well, this sure did interpret a segment of my life when I saw this. That I, I kind of wanted to believe, I wanted to be able to trust God, but I just, it was hard. I, I couldn't get it done, but I didn't know why, but it's because I had this inclination to law. See, I, I was 
cultured in a law type environment and in this you can't trust mm -hmm. law doesn't teach you to trust and it's not its purpose well, here's some conclusions I want to draw from this incident. Jesus has no regard for the traditions of men. Mm -hmm. Amen. If men teach you that you shouldn't be healed on the Sabbath day, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus doesn't pay attention to traditions of men. And Jesus does have regard for the helpless. Mm -hmm. They kind of gravitate to people who it's obvious are helpless. Maybe a man with a withered hand, maybe an impotent man on a pallet, or maybe a dead girl, maybe a boy that's being thrown down by a demon and wallowing in a fire and in the water. He's, he has attention. If you know you're helpless and you feel powerless, you say, I just can't seem to do anything about this. I want to, as best I can, convince you that you're the kind of person Jesus is drawn to. You're the one. He wants to help. The person who's helpless. And grace works publicly. Yeah. <laughs> right out in front of the stand forth. Mm -hmm. See? Right <clears throat> out here in front of the people. Grace can change you right under people's noses. Mm -hmm. And there's a conflict between law and grace between faith and works. There's a conflict. But, they, but grace and faith are superior. Mm -hmm. You can stretch out your hand even though the Pharisees are there. Yeah. You stretch it out anyway. And another thing, the deliverance makes criticism of non-effect. <laughs> you think this man has stretched out his hand? What did he care for what, the, what these people said? What they didn't make any difference. When your hand's not with it anymore, you don't have any you don't have any interest in what people say can't be done. Yeah. And being where Jesus is brings hope. Mm -hmm. If Jesus is in the house, what <laughs> stand forth. Mm -hmm. uh, stand forth. It awakens it awakens hope. Well, there's a lot of things to be seen in that marvelous miracle. We don't know who this man was. No, have no idea who this man was, what his name was or anything, but we will someday. Yeah. We'll see him on the other side. I can, I can almost see him now. <laughs> Here comes a... <laughs> I'm the man that had the withered hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll tell him, oh, 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 you helped me a lot. I never knew who you were, mm -hmm. but you put a spark of hope mm -hmm. in my heart. Mm -hmm. Thank God for these people.